So, aloha. Good afternoon. I, I hope to be able to wake you out of your postprandial torpor by telling you about Campachi, Seriola Rivoliana. As Rivoliana, it's actually a nice segue on, on from Kevin Main's presentation this morning when she was talking about Seriola dumeroli. This is a very closely related species. It can be distinguished. This is also called the long fin uh, amberjack uh, or the almaco jack. And you can see that the long, soft dorsal there on, on that fish in the centre there that distinguishes it from the dumeroli. Uh, this is cultured at commercial scale in Japan. The Japanese hamachi industry, yellowtail industry, 150, 180,000 tonnes a year. Maybe the data is really poor, but maybe 10% of that is <coughs> kampachi. But probably only 10% of that kampachi is rivoliana. The, mo the rest of it is dumeroli. It's all wild capture from uh, from fingerlings, and the Japanese say that they, they, the demerali growth rate is better and the fish is more hardy. We like Rivoliana because we can. We grow it because we can. That it, it, it is uh, achievable that we can produce these fish in the hatchery. We have been producing this fish previously in Kona. We were, uh, grew it from 2005 through to 2009 uh, and had it on the market as the Kona Kampachi. Uh, the Obviously, the, the brood stock and the hatchery technology is in hand and it is commercially available. Uh, there's a number of different hatcheries that have been able to produce this fish. What's really attractive about it is its fast growth. They'll get to 2.2 kilos in between 9 to 12 months, depending on temperature, and we'll talk about temperature more later. We generally focus on a harvest size between about 1.8 kilos and, and 2.5 kilos. They can get to 1.8 kilos in eight months or so. And from an economic perspective, you're always looking at your feed conversion ratio because a commercial farm, it should be at least 60% of your operating costs are feed. If it's not, then all of your other costs are too expensive and you've got to get more efficient. And so feed conversion ratio for this fish to a harvest size of 1.8 kilos, it can get as low as about 1.35. Uh, to get to a, a one kilo, sized fish, it can do that under one to one. Uh, and it also works very well. Most of you have probably heard of this species, of the Kona Kampachi, or the company that's selling it at the moment is calling it Hawaiian Kun Pachi with an N. Uh, it's got very good traction both in the sushi trade and as a cooked product. It has, uh, on the right diet, it will have up over 30% fat by dry weight. And so that's what makes it such a, a great and unctuous sashimi uh, and it, it's tremendous fish to cook with. The catches. There are always catches. If this was easy, then idiots would have been doing it a long time ago. Uh, primarily, it is, uh, as a very high-end product, there's a very thin layer of cream in, in the US market. There's not a lot of appreciation beyond the sushi trade for a really high-quality fish like this. And so when you're coming onto the market also with a new species, People aren't familiar with it. In Hawaii, the wild fish has a, issues both with a, a uh, parasite in the flesh and with ciguatera. And so the local name of kahala was just considered an unsaleable fish. There was literally no market for kahala in Hawaii. And also down in the Gulf, it's part of the yellowtail, uh, sorry, the amberjack fishery in the Gulf that's both dumeroli and Rivoliana, and, and that's considered a, a fairly low-grade fish, I think primarily because it's not snapper. If it was handled better, if fishermen handled it better and marketed it better, I think they'd do a, a lot better with it. So we found with the Kona Kampachi, it worked very well in food service, uh, at white tablecloth and at sushi, where you had a chef who could explain to people what this Kona Kampachi was. But in retail, it sat on the shelf and it, it didn't move, and so unless we had uh, a, a couple of, of retailers who took the time to educate their counter staff and didn't have fast high turnover on their counter staff, and it worked well there. But in retail, it was up over twenty dollars per pound for a fillet, and there's not a lot that you can do with, with it uh, at that price. The biggest challenge in uh, culture of this fish, as Kevin had spoken of with the dumeroli, it is the skin fluke. It's a three to five millimetre ectoparasite uh, that in and of itself is not a problem for the fish. They can have 
20, 30, a, a large fish could have 50 skin flukes per fish and that's not the problem. It's the fish will get itchy and they'll start flashing on any surface that they can in, in a tank or on the net. They'll break the skin and then you'll get a secondary infection and that's where you'll get uh, mortality. But if there is a high skin fluke count, the fish will also go off feed. And so managing skin flukes on an individual fish basis for brood stock or so, you can do a fresh water dip. Uh, for commercial culture, that doesn't work. Uh, particularly, most of these cultures are in more expo the, these net pens are in more exposed sites, and so there has to be a hydrogen peroxide bath. That's the the only permitted treatment. Uh, Prosequantil is effective, but it's very expensive, uh, and it has uh, palatability issues for the fish, and it's not permitted in the U.S. Uh, for brood stock, the biggest issue is cryptocarrion. This gives all of us nightmares all the time. I mean, this can literally come in and take out a tank of broodstock overnight. If the technician, if they're feeding, the, the broodstock technician is feeding the fish, they'll go off the feed a little bit one day and the next day they could all be dead or, or zombies. Uh, it is treatable with uh, low salinity extended bath, as Kevin was talking about for the treatment for neobenodynia that she has done, uh, but it's still, it appears seemingly de novo in broodstock tanks, and that, that is a huge challenge. In larval rearing, the main challenge is epitheliocystis, but that is just, that most of that is resolvable just by good hatchery practices, a, a, a dry out and clean out in between larval runs, uh, and uh, all in, all out in, in your hatchery management. Uh, for Nursery culture or for any large scale RAS, a fish that grows this fast strips oxygen out of the water like you would not believe. And so the scalability of this fish in an RAS system I have to think is uh, going to be very difficult to achieve to get to a larger fish. Perhaps if you were going to a pan sized fish that might work, but you're still going to have breathtaking oxygen bills here. And then for offshore culture, <coughs> the main constraint there in terms of geographical area is temperature. Uh, this fish essentially stops growing at 18 centigrade and so it slows down a lot at anywhere under about 22. Uh, it does very well at, at 30 degrees and above. They grow so fast that if you put your ear close to the pen you can hear their bones cracking as they hulk like it's been. But at those sort of, sorts of temperatures it's like running a Ferrari at 120 miles an hour. If something's going to go wrong it's going to go wrong very quickly. Uh, just a brief overview of the commercial culture here. Uh, some credit to the folk at Oceanic Institute and uh, Randy Cates, who'd done the initial trials with this. Actually, credit to Dan Bonetti for first. He was the first one to close the cycle on this fish back in Ecuador in, what was it, 1930s, Dan? Uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, but there, the, the, it, we, Dan was looking at, at pond culture, and so th that was, I epitheliocystis was an issue there. Uh, Randy Cates had attempted offshore grout in a uh, submerged sea station pen and had issues with the, the skin flukes that he wasn't able to resolve. And then we started work with it at Kona Blue Water Farms. We were the first to commercialise this because we had uh, the ocean spa folk had worked with us to be able to make the sea stations to be able to raise them up to rim level. And so then we could tarp off the bottom of the sea station uh, and that allowed us to do an effective bath treatment. It was, still was a real challenge to control the skin flukes because just keeping the netting clean, keeping the biofouling down. Uh, Blue Ocean Mariculture bravely stepped up and took over that operation in 2009 and they've been running it ever since. Between We were doing 500 tonnes in our best year with Kona Blue Water Farms uh, and uh, Blue Ocean Mariculture last year did around 600 tonnes. Uh, they've got permission to expand up to around 1,000 tonnes. Then I think they have plans to do that now. And we've also looked at, uh, done culture work with this fish in other uh, small demonstration pens. The Valella Beta test, which was the unanchored drifter cage, the Gamma test, which was a single point mooring. And we're looking to do some work in the Gulf with the Valella Epsilon, which Denny Peters spoke on earlier. For those of you who aren't familiar with the, the Kona Blue site, it was about a half mile offshore in Kona. It's a very steep drop off there. So this was about 200 feet of water, brisk currents through that site which made the tarp treatments very challenging. Uh, the, the currents, because it's on the back of the big island there and there's a lot of eddying in there, the currents could change in five minutes and you'd have tarps and divers drifting off 
down current, uh, and you'd have to go and be picking them up. It, it, it's a challenging site, uh, but it's also superb water quality, uh, visibility of, of usually 100 feet plus. Uh, these are the 3,000 cubic metre sea stations that we were using initially with a Dyneema netting. Uh, they're currently using an 8,000 cubic metre pen which has Kiko net on the top and uh, uh, the copper alloy on the bottom. Uh, and other folk, uh, Tyler and uh, Felipe, have spoken about the, the beauty of the copper alloy in previous presentations. Uh, we'd also done a, a single surface pen demonstration project, thank you Salton Stall Kennedy, at 6,000 cubic metres there with a, a, a Kiko net mesh. Uh, as just a, a demonstration project. That was the first uh, polar circle style culture of this fish. And we think that, that the, the, having access to your fish from the surface is, is we think, going to be very important uh, as we scale this, this fish up. Uh, the Villela beta test was our first uh, test with this species uh, with a copper alloy mesh. And this was the uh, unanchored drifter cage that we had that had drifted around in the back of the big island. Uh, eight months to, for the total grow out, but we had something magical happened around this pen. We got these fish to a harvest size from, we put them in about 180 grams, we got them to 1.8 kilos in about four and a half months. The feed conversion ratio was phenomenal and the survival was 98%. The trouble is, how do you commercialise an unanchored drifter pen? Uh, so we got a little bit smarter the second time around. We said, let's at least put down one anchor so that we know where the cage is. Uh, and this was the, the gamma test. It also uh, was very good in terms of feed conversion, efficiency, growth rate and survival of, of the fish there. And so we're looking now to uh, go and do a further demonstration project. Both the beta test and the gamma test were tremendous in terms of, of helping the local fishing community understand the value of offshore aquaculture. We're trying to do the same thing here now uh, with the, the Epsilon test, which will be 40 miles out offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. We don't necessarily want to go 40 miles offshore, but we want to be in sufficiently deep water so that there's a disconnect between the substrate and what's in the pen. Broodstock, I'm getting the hook here, I'm sorry, but this is, uh, broodstock is in hand. Uh, there are a number of uh, operations that have broodstock. Blue Ocean Mariculture has about six pens of broodstock. Uh, we have a couple of, uh, sorry, six tanks of broodstock. We have a couple of tanks ourselves in Kona and Mota's doing some work with this species as well. Uh, th they will spawn consistently throughout the year uh, un unless temperature drops down below, below about 22 degrees centigrade, 20 degrees centigrade. And you'll get between 300,000 and a million eggs per spawn two or three times a week. There's also broodstock in uh, a couple of operations. Our commercial company in Mexico. Uh, if you're thinking about commercialising a species, you've got to think about the competitive landscape. And this is uh, the Sea of Cortez. It, this fish is native there and we are moving forward commercially there with a submersible uh, surface pen there. The R&D, and I'm running out of time, the R&D priorities here are feed formulations. To get a fish to grow this fast, you've got to put a really high octane diet in there. Uh, it's about a 43% protein, 23% fat. Uh, we really want to focus on ways that we can reduce the cost there. It runs around $2,000 a tonne, $2 a kilo, so that's what makes your pricing difficult uh, to, to thread that needle there. Uh, the other experimental work that we've done with, with replacement diets has been uh, highly encouraging on the ability to be able to replace the fish meal with soy protein. And we've also been really uh, excited by seeing the variation in growth rate. The left-hand graph there shows you the variation in growth rate. Uh, that, that's at the final weighing event there. The soy, there's a lot more spread in the, the soy fish, and that's a genetic propensity for some fish there to be able to assimilate soy. We've now gone and done some work with selective breeding on this, uh, working with CAT out of San Diego. There's a lot of opportunity uh, to both improve the diet and improve the disease resistance. Mastering near Benedenia is the real key for this species. Lots of excitement. It's certainly worth a deep look. Thank you very much. Since I uh, took up a little bit of his time, we'll take one minute or one, one question for him while I change the slides.
The question was, how does the cryptocurrion get into the hatchery environment in, in the broodstock? Some of us would say it's magic that they teleport somehow from the open. I mean, it, it's, you can have an RAS system and it just appears. I mean, most of these systems, in our experience in Kona, is we're close enough to the ocean that it's either salt spray is coming in, bird poo, how, how else? I mean, we have very rigorous biosecurity uh, protocols in place and it still just, it appears, and it has a quorum sensing thing there. And so y y your cryptocurrency will build up, you won't be able to see it, but then it, it just comes and it hits. I think that there's, that's why we're really pleased to see Kevin and Moat doing their work because they're on an RAS system 40, mile, 40 miles inland. And so that's about the best that you can do in terms of, of uh, fire security for broodstock, short of... Now I'm going to <laughs> Thank you very much.